Hello and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with Neural, the business podcast that brings the boardroom to you. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of Neural. I wanted to take a moment before we start to say thank you for all the support and positive feedback on the podcast. One recent comment from at Yovir Gill stood out, which highlighted finding a mentor in Enter the Boardroom. If anyone listening is interested in finding a traditional in-person mentor, do consider joining the Neural Board community, which you can find at community.neural.com. That's community.neural.com. For just £29 a month, we have created a space where you can get matched with a mentor, as well as learn, grow your board network, and tap into the hive mind of over 60,000 board members in real time. Today's guest, Martin Gilbert, has 40 years of experience in the asset management industry. He was co-founder and CEO of Aberdeen Asset Management, which later merged with Standard Life to form Standard Life Aberdeen. Following the merger, Martin was respectively co-CEO, vice chair of the group, and chair of Aberdeen Standard Investments, the asset management business of SLA. In 2015, Martin was ranked by Harvard Business Review 22nd out of over 900 in its list of the world's top performing CEOs. He's currently chair of Revolut, Asico, Tosca Fund, Net Zero Technology Center in Aberdeen, and Scottish Golf. He is also a senior independent director at Glencore PLC and non-executive director at the European Tour. Martin, a huge welcome and thank you so much for joining today. No problem. I'm looking forward to it. You were co-founder and CEO of Aberdeen from 1983 to 2017. And during that period, just had an incredible growth journey. I think in the first year, the business had £70 million AUM and reported profits uh, before tax of £87. And by 2016, that was £352 million of profit with £312 billion AUM. Now, in the first part of that journey, I think Aberdeen grew organically. It sounds like you had the, an amazing group of people around the table. Can you think of specific ways that they added value to you? I think, bear in mind, we were sort of there at the beginning of asset management to a large extent, because what you see now in asset management is a huge industry. Back in the 80s, it was a cottage industry, and there might have been four big asset managers in the UK in the 90s. So they were really helpful to us, especially in terms of strategy, especially in terms of corporate advice. Because for the first few years, as you say, we did grow organically. But then after that, we, we really grew by a mixture of organic growth and inorganic growth or acquisitions in the asset management space. So we made about 40 or 50 acquisitions at, at Aberdeen, but, but the board were especially helpful during the early years in guiding us because we were so small at that time. I mean, it's, it's quite a long time ago, so most people won't remember the BP rights issue in 1987. These sort of things were where the board really helped because a lot of them had experience before. I mean, interest rates were still at well over 10%, 14, 15%. So yeah, it was really useful to have their, to have their take on the interest rate environment in those days. Interesting. Okay. So you moved into this heavy acquisition phase and you acquired a number of businesses. How did the board support you through that? I think a really good director is questioning when things are going well and supportive when times are tough. Now, a lot of directors are the opposite. They're very supportive when things are going well. Then when things start to go wrong, they become questioning as opposed to supportive because we didn't sign up for things to go wrong, if you follow me. So I think once you put that lens on directors, so often when things were going really well, the really good directors would be questioning you much more than you really thought was relevant. But they were actually digging away and making you think about things. And good directors also would say to you during the tough times, don't try and trade yourself out of this, this area. Don't cut at the point of maximum pain. So there are various, various attributes I would place to really good directors during that period. And 
yeah, they would stop us doing some acquisitions and that turned out to be correct. And when you look back and they would be very questioning when you were making acquisitions as well, which they would always look at the downside of doing something. In my time with five or six very good chairmen who were incredibly supportive. So yeah, we, we were just really lucky with the quality of directors we we had. We had no right to have such good directors over the years. Can you bring that a bit to life on how they did that? Because So I, I came from a private equity background originally, and so I've, I've seen many acquisitions done when the entire boardroom was pregnant with deal fever and an information bias. Everyone had done, you know, done a lot of work and therefore there was a natural desire to get the thing done, a sort of sunk cost to it. And actually it was very difficult in those situations for anyone to pull the whole, that whole momentum back when, you know, people had started framing things in a certain way. <laughs> did the directors that you worked with who did that effectively go about that? I'll give you one example, a guy called Joe Bernard Stewart. He had been chairman and CEO of Flemings and Flemings had a mandatory retirement age at 60. So here was a guy just absolutely at his peak. We were fortunate. He had a house up in Aberdeen. So a holiday home up in Aberdeen and he wanted to have an interest up in Aberdeen. And it was that sort of director. And I remember he was, he was incredibly good. He just would be very, very forensic in his questioning, but very, no, not in a nasty sort of way, but very, very good questions. Uh, he would say, why do you want to go into private client asset management, for instance, and I had to justify it. And in the end we didn't because, you know, once he, once you, he made you think about it, it, it changed your mind, but you're right. You know, they get some momentum to a deal and it is very difficult to, uh, to stop a deal. And I, there was one recently at Asset Co where I felt uncomfortable and didn't stop it. And of course it turned out to be the wrong decision not to stop. It. So yeah, you've got to, uh, I should have pressed harder as chairman and said, look, guys, I've seen this before. We shouldn't do this. And yeah, you, it's, it's a very delicate balance being a being a good director. I mean, hi hindsight is a wonderful thing. And obviously we all have 2020 yeah. vision with hindsight. I think what's always interesting to me is how one goes back and independent of the outcome of the decision or the action, what is there that we could have done differently at the, at the time? Because it's easy to say, oh, I should have pushed harder, but I'm sure at the time you were doing your best. So is there anything that you have kind of learned from those experiences? Mm -hmm that you have actually been able to operate differently as a result? One of the things I've learned is always go with your first instinct and don't change your mind. Now, you know who the good people are and you know who people who are less good. And what you should do is make your decision quickly and implement your decision quickly because that is what people want. They don't want uncertainty. They want to know what's happening very quickly and people can then plan their lives. They either stay or they leave or whatever. So that, that probably more than anything else is what I learned. Anytime I changed my mind, I lived to regret it months later because you didn't do what you should have done, so to speak. I guess that, that falls a little bit into that sort of Gladwell school of thinking of you know, when you face with really complex decisions, tap into your emotions because you can mm. overanalyze them. There was a, another book I was reading recently called Decisive by Chip and Dan Heath, where they have a model rooted in a whole load of data that says, you know, what they call RAP. So they encourage people to widen the options, then test them as much as you can, the sort of real world applicability of them, get some distance from them and then assume it's going to fail and do a pre-mortem on it. Yeah. I suppose that widen the options piece runs against a little bit that instinct, because I sometimes find it a board meeting, I'm sort of instinctively thinking, okay, yes or no, we shouldn't be doing that. But that widen the options, how, how do you reconcile the tension there between those two things of following your instinct with making sure that you're considering enough, that you're not just biased by what happens to be in front of you at the time? 
I think, I think that by having a good team round about you, you do want some people in your team who, who do look at the downside of, uh, of any action. I've always tended to be just looking at the upside and thinking, look, I can, I can sort this, I can make it work. So I was very, very lucky during the years that the 20 odd years at Aberdeen, we had a very strong team of accountants and lawyers who were there at the start of the business and, and were there right till the end, right till the merger, which was standard line. And to a certain extent, they would be the counterweight to my uh, credible optimism that uh, I could make anything work basically. And they would say, listen, just don't do this. So yeah. I think that's how we did it by having good, having complimentary people round about you. And, and that's why you don't need people who are all the same in, the, in an organization. I love that. So you, you have the natural optimist of a classic yeah. entrepreneur and you're saying surround yourselves with the, the book critics, sort of the author. So you get that balance. How does that fit so then with your earlier point around holding with your initial view because if you've got someone like you who's the author who's got your initial view yes this is something we should do we should go ahead and you've got someone else whose initial view is no for all these reasons and somehow one has to reconcile those and someone has to well, get yeah they would always trust my instinct up to a point but if if it was something they genuinely believed was wrong they would they would really put their foot down at that point say listen this is not what we should be doing but yeah, and to a certain extent, they use that, people use that card rarely, don't they? And when they do use it, you should listen because there's usually a really good reason if someone who is more deeply analytical than you and who's much more into the figures than you, like our CFO, Bill Rattree, if he said to me, Martin, this is not for us, I would say, okay, I understand. Tell me why, but I would not. I would know, I would try and answer his concerns, but if I couldn't, we wouldn't do it. Interesting. Let's talk a bit more about Revolut. How different do you see the running of that organization now versus the organization you ran? Have some things fundamentally changed or is it essentially the same with a few superficial changes in terms of the things that you have to get right as a board? So obviously at Revolut, I've moved from being a CEO of a founder to being the chairman of, uh, and, uh, and handling and being chairman to a founder. The reason selected me or the reason we decided to go the course we have is because I had founded a business. He wanted someone who'd grown a business, scaled a business and had the necessary regulatory, uh, experience. So. To a certain extent, I can handle him. I, I think I handle him pretty well because he's a typical founder, especially of a fintech. And he's older than, than me when he started the business. He's much, much richer than, than me. But, but apart from that, he's, he's driven. He's very, very good. But I think what you have to do as chairman is understand what, what, how to handle him. And that's the, that's the key, I would say, to being the chairman, to a, a founder of a business, even though you are a founder yourself, it's very different. First of all, establish the boundaries between the chairman and the, and the CEO. I think that is very important because nothing is going to frustrate a, a Nikolai more than someone who thinks he's a hands-on chairman and who's going to uh, be running the company or thinks he's going to be running the company and he's there to well, to overly govern the, the CEO. So we have very clear boundaries. I never interfere. I speak to him every week. I never interfere in any management decisions. I help him. If I do have something, I do speak to him directly. I'll say to him, I think we need to put more resource in here or more resource in there. And what I've found is he's a brilliant listener, very, very smart. He listens, he understands the point. And if he agrees with it, he'll implement it straight away. So it's establishing those boundaries. 
Then the next most important thing is to, as I said earlier, to be supportive when things are not going according to plan, which is inevitable in a founder-led business or a, or a small fintech with very short lines of communication. Controls would tend to lag behind the growth because everything is designed to uh, implement fast growth and scalability. So yeah, th that's also really, really important to be supported. Can you give me some ex examples of, of when you've done that and how, how you've gone about it? Because I guess there's one thing to sort of sit there going, look, well, I'm sorry, that must be tough for you. <laughs> but ultimately that, I don't know, it doesn't really help much when you're there. In those well, I think, I, you know, if something goes wrong, I say to I wouldn't worry about it. If I was you, we'll get over it. You know, just uh, like everything else, you know that people don't make, People are smart, but so never make the same mistake again. Or they'll ask me how serious is this. I say, look, it'd be better if it hadn't happened. But but look, we'll 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 manage it and we'll get through it. And, and I suppose, really, looking back to Aberdeen when we were going through the really tough times of 2002 to 2005, I had chairman who supported me and the board supported me 100. percent I offered my resignation and. And they didn't accept it. And they said, no, we, we want you to sort this out. And I, and, and I did, but they were incredibly supportive. I mean, nowadays there is no chance I would have survived that sort of, that sort of period of being under regulatory scrutiny and being investigated, all these things. So uh, I think to have a supportive board because being chairman, being CEO is a really tough job. And the last thing you need is to be looking over your shoulder to see that the board are not supporting you. So I've always made it absolutely clear with companies I'm chairman, I'm hundred percent behind the CEO, it, but in return, they've got to be absolutely open with me or with whoever's chairman and tell me what the problems are. You don't want to be hearing about them secondhand. You want to know there's a problem quickly. You want to know how it's being dealt with. And but in return, your job is to support them through the tough times as well as the uh, good times. It feels to me like the world has become a less forgiving place of mistakes and has forgotten actually the value of mistakes. That actually, when people make mistakes, as you say, when they're smart, they usually learn from them and they're better for them. And yet, most of the time now, when I see, I guess Alison Rose is a good example, people making mistakes who have huge amounts of talent. Uh, you, who have different views on how big a mistake that was and what's an unforgivable mistake. But the board there stood behind her initially and then got blown out of the way effectively by the sort of court of public opinion, political political opinion. Does it feel like it's got harder and do you think that's right? And and, and what can boards and chairs in particular do in the face of that sort of onslaught when they're trying to do the right thing in difficult situations like that? Oh, I mean... You're undoubtedly right. The world has become a much less forgiving space. And as I said, I wouldn't have survived the 2002 to 2005 onslaught. On. So to a certain extent, that the news is less immediate. It's, it's much more immediate now. It's less immediate then. So there wasn't the same pressure that comes on boards. The regulators now are far tougher. You, you, you saw that with the NatWest situation where the board were probably minded to support, as you said, the court of public opinion plus the, and the court of public opinion tends to sway politicians and regulators. So, so it just became impossible to, uh, for the board to continue supporting a CEO. They probably had absolute faith in for the for running the business going forward. So yeah, it is a much less forgiving place as you, as you've said. Now you, as I touched on at the beginning, you are a very rare and I think really critical sort of archetype to have sitting in listed company boards. Uh, most founders I know, successful founders I know, just wouldn't want to be on a listed company board. You've got all the governance, you've got all the reputational risk. You're not compensated. Um, as as you could be if you were to, you know if you're capable of getting those sorts of roles you're capable of getting far better compensated executive roles 
and, and there, there is a lot of box ticking that you, you have to go through. So what on earth is the reason that you sort of take on these, these listed? Well, I think it's very important for CEOs to take on one additional non-executive role because even though you're busy, you're actually an ideal non-exec. When I was at Aberdeen, I did first group, which I was lucky enough to be a founding director of. And we built that into the biggest surface transport company in the world from 200 buses in Aberdeen. And then I did Sky, which was fantastic, and Glencore. And you learn from these boards. I mean, you, you really do. And so the experience is invaluable. So I'll always do interesting boards. So I put Sky and Glencore and First Group into that category. What I'm not that keen to do is just what I would term a, a big box ticking board that you're not really understanding or that you can't make a difference. So I enjoy small ones as well, especially if you can get some equity. You can make money at these. And obviously at Revolut, we were given some. When we weren't being paid director's fees, we were given, we were given equity in the, the business, which has been nice. So yeah, I don't do it for nothing. I do Scottish golf for nothing, by the way, but I, I'm passionate about diversity and participation in golf. So I do that for nothing. And I enjoy that as well. So yeah, if you can get, if you can get experienced CEOs to come on, it, it's really useful. And if you can get a CEO to come on, an active CEO, it's even better because A, they're short of time, so they're not going to interfere in the, the day-to-day running of the business. But what they're going to do is really give you incredible, incredible support because there's a sort of, if you're a fellow CEO, you support the other CEOs because really they're the only people you can speak to. So you give incre- you'll get incredible support, incredible information that incredible just knowledge of other businesses from doing it i've talked a lot in the past on the podcast about one of my favorite books called ceo excellence where they look at the data of the highest performing ceos and one of the common characteristics is they all have an independent board role because exactly yeah. as you said it helps them reframe and be better at their own job as well as but we haven't what we haven't talked so much about is the value that they add on the boards themselves. And it sounds like you've worked with quite a few. Can you expand a bit on that? Where, when you have CEOs on your board, I guess there's always the risk that they will be too executive. But where, what value have you got? Well, and can you think of specific examples? Well, I, I don't think they can be too executive because they, they don't have the time. So I think that's one of the great attributes is, is they're very high level and they're very, they get straight to the point. They understand strategy. They understand the problems you're going through because they can be similar problems from another industry. So they make very, very good. And they're interested. They're also good CEOs are super interested, super inquisitive and super just want to mop up information and they spend all their time. I used to spend all my time on other boards, trying to understand how that board worked, how that company worked. I copied ideas from Sky. I, I copied a, an idea from James Murdoch to form a committee. Not a board director, one board director and, and employees to look at the technology. What was, what was coming down the road? What would, what would make us a better company? So we used to spend a lot of time on that. Look at the future. And as I say, it wasn't typical board directors, but I'd learned that idea at Sky. I learned, I learned lots of, I learned from first group about safety. I learned from first group who to look and see what the most critical person in the hierarchy of a company is, who is the person that makes that company work. And, and at first group in the yellow bus division, it was the depot manager. The depot manager had to get a hundred yellow buses out there in the morning to pick up school kids. He had to get them out. If he didn't, people weren't going to pick up the school kids to go to school. And the knock on effects of that were dramatic. So I learned there and I look at supermarkets, who's the most critical person in the hierarchy of a supermarket. And and I look at it in banks as well. I look and see, is it the bank manager or the country manager, or is it, I want to, that, that's the sort of inquisitive nature you need to have as a non-exec. 
I love that. So, so tell me, so who is it in a supermarket? Who is it in a, in a bank? And what do you, how do you use that insight as a board member once you've got it? Well, I use it and I use it in investment as well, because I mean, yeah, let's take the supermarket as an example. I mean, I suspect it's the most important person in the structure there is the person who runs that individual store because a good store manager or a, or if you look at it in banking, I think in, in big banks, it would be the country manager who's the most important person in a big retail bank as they used to be, it would have been the bank manager themselves who knew everyone, et cetera. So, so yeah, it's really, and, and to a certain extent, I think sometimes they just, sometimes the unforeseen circumstances of dismantling uh, an organization you've got to look through as well, because, uh, because I'm not sure in banking, for instance, with the, the sort of power being taken away from the branches, it's really helped, it's really helped the, the, the product and it's become less customer orientated, which of course is what's allowed revolutes of this world to come absolutely through the front door and take huge, huge amounts of business away from retail banks. I sometimes cry with laughter going through some of the traditional banks as customer experience, just thinking there is yeah. really no one on that board who has been through this experience as I get transferred, you know, from one country to the next and told each different department has the solution to my problems until eventually after about 15 loops, I get back to the person I started yeah. with who also laughs at the experience. I love this idea of the sort of futurist or future oriented subcommittee because there's, a, there's some really interesting data on that that shows the highest performing boards simply spend more days on their strategy than low or mid-impact boards. And I suppose by having a dedicated committee focused on looking forward, you're going to achieve that or are much more likely to achieve that. Can you give me some examples of a practical value that came out of that? And is that now something you do with every board? It was an idea, as I say, I picked up from James Murdoch on the Sky Board and we implemented it at Aberdeen. And, and as I say, it wasn't a typical board committee. It was chaired by a board, but you need someone who's pretty tech savvy uh, to chair it. And then you get people from across the organization. We would run a competition as well to come up with ideas that would make our business more efficient. And they did. They came up with brilliant ideas and and, you know, in an organization, I mean, to go back to the sky team, the sky board, I mean, one of the things I learned there was that marginal improvement that, uh, if you get 1%, they improvement in, I mean, it, it really does work. And uh, that's what you want in an organization as well. You don't need to be making huge, big you just look for 1% here, 1% there, 1% here, 1% there. It certainly accumulates across the, across the, the organization. So yeah, it was great. And, 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 but also what it did was it brought the people in the organization more towards the board. They could see the board were interested in what they had to say. And yeah, it was an obvious frustration that you don't implement every idea. But it's still incredible what you can achieve if you unleash the power in an organization with ideas. Create that sense of autonomy. Yeah. Mastery and purpose in the, in the words of Daniel Pink. Very powerful. I want to go back to that idea, the concept that you outlined there of the person at the sort of point of, I think you called it most risk, where they have the sort of highest impact. Once yeah. you've identified those people in an organization as a board member, what are you doing with them and how does that change or how are you interacting with that knowledge? I remember speaking of the person with the most impact in an organization, I remember one of our directors saying, look, there's someone in your organization, he's sitting probably in the basement, he's sitting there and he sees every email that's going through this organization, he's sitting there and He's in control. He's sitting in front of the screen and all he sees is stuff. He said, he's probably paid nothing. You better identify that person and pay him a bit more because that is your biggest risk of cyber leak. 
you just pick off that one person who sees everything. And I'll always remember that advice. And we looked for that person and they were in the basement. No, they were, yeah, they're, they're never in the best area. So it's about finding that and then, and then really empower, making sure you look after that person more than anything else. So when we used to go on site visits at first group, the CEO was brilliant right up to the, the depot manager, shall we say, when we were at the yellow bus depot and just say, what a great job you're doing. You know, how many buses have you got? Is there anything I could do to help? All of these sort of things that just make that person feel appreciated. And you take a store manager in a supermarket, again, direct, you go and visit them and you know, just tell them what a great job they're doing, basically. I love that. It reminds me, I've often heard people say that, you know, often it'll be 10% of the organization will be creating 90% of the value. And yet very rarely does the CEO and the board allocate their time proportionately yeah. for that value creation. It sounds like you're saying when you're identifying those points of highest leverage, it's both risk and also value creation. And yeah. you create time at the board to follow through on that or... You, you create time around the board to follow up on that. Yeah. So you make sure the board meet these people at a dinner or at drinks after the board or whatever it might be. You just make sure, you know, if you go to the Singapore office, you have a staff function, you make sure, you know, I would say to the head of Singapore, tell me who you need me to speak to. And, you know, he would say, I'd like, I'd go up to this guy, say this, go up to this guy and say that. So you've got to be that, you've got to be that good at, at detail as well. You go up, up and do that. And with fund managers, you've got to remember it's a really tough job being a fund manager because you're measured every day. And always my advice to them was, look, if you're underperforming, whatever you do, don't try and trade your way out. Oh, are you happy with the stocks you hold? Yeah, I am. I say, hold them then, don't trade. And because you've got to remember there's a propensity amongst management, C directors, whatever, to cut at the point of maximum pain. The really good fund managers could go through that point of maximum pain and come out the, the other side. So a good example would be shall we say in 1990, the late nineties tech stocks, if you remember going through the roof and people didn't own them and then they would cut, just cut, just, they can't, they can't take this pain any longer, say in November 99 and they would buy. And then the market, they, they all fell in, in 2000 and that to me is the double whammy. You lost on the way up and you lose on the way down. So you've got to, you've got to have that. You've got to have that mental toughness to just get through the pain. It feels to me like that's probably a challenge that a lot of investment trust boards right now are, are wrestling with. Where probably a lot of their value is encouraging their, you know, the investment decision makers to hold the course and not to sort of make changes when they can think of a number right now that are under huge pressure because they're sort of you know, traded down significantly. Is that, is that something that you found your boards giving, giving you value with? Yeah. I mean, that comes back to my point. I said, I would repeat earlier, which is good directors are supportive at the moment. Whereas the poorer directors are being questioning when things when things have started to go wrong and, you know, and genuinely believed, why did you not foresee this was going to happen? And, and they've got to have that toughness to just see it through. Now let's wait and see what, how, how some of them, some of them do react, but I'm with you a hundred percent. They've just got to stick as long as they're doing the right thing, they should stick with the, the portfolio they have. What I would say again that I've learned from managing over 40 investment trusts at Aberdeen is, is a lot of managers, and I place this at the managers rather than the board, a lot of the managers don't manage the structure, i.e. they don't buy back shares enough, they don't manage the structure. 
they think their job is just managing the portfolio. Their job is not only to manage the portfolio, but also to manage the structure. And that's where boards also should step up and say to the manager, listen, we're on a deep discount here. Buy in the stock, buy in the stock, buy, buy, buy. And uh, yeah, a lot of them don't want to. Always strike me as an area where, where the court of public opinion is often incredibly ill-informed. And the sort of the debates that rage on about, you know, whether a yeah. uh, manager should be buying back stocks and whether that provides value to the uh, underlying shareholders or not, just sometimes struck me as just completely. If, if you're buying back stock at a big discount, it's good for the shareholders. A wonderful thing. You're getting to invest, reinvest at discount yeah. rates and the things you already know and understand. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. The fine new things. Just want to touch on or go back to the, the sort of topic of investment trust, particularly. You've obviously had huge amounts of experience there. We, we have a lot of investment trusts hiring board members through yep. the platform to become a bit of a specialty. And one of the things that sometimes amazes me is how little some of the boards seem to think about their strategy and don't think of themselves in terms of how do we create a you know competitive moat, but how are we going to differentiate ourselves? versus other players there and they have quite the the ambition and the strategy and the vision for what they're trying to achieve as an organization is is very limited and and i think it goes a little bit to the point you were making earlier around they don't think of not just what are they investing in but how are they managing the the sort of the corporate structure for someone listening to this now who is a board member on an investment trust what and who, who wanted to know well you know, Martin, what are the things that I can do that be most valuable as a board member for this investment trust? What are the best investment trust board members that you've seen? I think they're asking questions about the structure, basically. Why is this? Why are we less well rated than X who are in the same sector? And normally it's because they don't work hard enough on differentiating themselves from other trusts in the, in the same sector as then. They don't, they're not skilled enough, a lot of them at marketing as well. How do you create that, yeah, that aura that even though you're not performing that well, or that you, that you still have a cult following. And I always used two at Aberdeen who had that cult following. One was Hugh Young, obviously in Asia, great, great fund manager, especially in the early years, he had, he had a really great, great following. You, you saw it in Fidelity with, with Bolton. He had that cult following. You see it with Bruce Stout at, at uh, Murray International. He'd get 500 people at the AGM to listen to him say how bad the world was. And then you had sort of James Anderson and Bailey Gifford at the other extreme. But that's what you want. You want something that's just going to take you out of the ordinary a bit and, and that's going to make retail investors buy the shares. Because it's all about retail investing in these businesses. And whether we like it or not, as an asset manager, we always wanted asset managers to, we wanted it to be an Aberdeen sort of client base. But what in the individual investors want is a story. They want to say, look, I'm, I'm in Hugh Young's fund or I'm in Anthony Bull, so whatever it is. So yeah, it was those, they've got to manage the, the structure better. Because to a certain extent, they can't manage the portfolio because that's delegated away to the, the, the relevant asset manager. And they've got to trust him to do the right job. Interesting. Yeah. Ter Terry Smith is one that sort of really stands out for me in that, oh, yeah, creating love, that brand. I, in the sort of I love Terry. I know Terry really, really well. He's, he's a brilliant fund manager. Again, he's got that aura. You know, what a business he's built. You know, and, uh, and, and he does it yeah, again, he's got that cult following. I don't trade. I just buy good quality stocks. I hold them and I, t I, I, I hold them through the cycle and occasionally he'll, you know, attack someone like the CEO, one of my friends, the CEO of Unilever, even though, uh, I thought it was a bit unfair, but, but he, he's, he's, he's a really, really good fund manager. 
So does that mean, do you think, as a board member, if I'm sitting there listening to you now, I'd be thinking, gosh, maybe if my manager right now hasn't got that personality, that cult, that clarity of vision. You know, there are so many investment trusts where they're investing in, I don't know, like 50 plus stocks where they don't really understand them as opposed to, you know, a lot of the ones you've talked on there, how real sort of conviction more of from that school of Benjamin Graham investing. So is, is that what you would be encouraging I'm not suggesting they go down a particular style like value because, of course, James Anderson was at the other extreme from value. One of my friends who's a big investor, he holds two investment trusts. He holds James Anderson and he holds Bruce Stout, and he sees them in the same day and they have directly opposite views of the world. And then, of course, over the last 10 years, James Anderson has far outperformed, but probably over the last two years, Bruce Stouts had a, had a better type. So you need balance in your portfolio. So what I'm suggesting is just take an, t- look at it from the outside in rather than the inside out. I, you've got to trust your fund manager to manage the money. Then what you've got to do is decide whether you promote him to, to be the person that you you use to market it. And unless you're a very old one, of course, a very old trust, which has been around a hundred years, which a lot have sometimes, sometimes, of course, they have the structure is fine. The, the name is fine. You know, it's just look at it from the outside in. What would make me buy this? Why would I buy this over X and then one of the other investment trusts in the sector? Yeah, it strikes me as remarkable that many of them haven't really come into the 21st century with the way they market yeah. digital consumer. And, and the data, the, I'm not convinced they use, a lot of them use data as much as they, they should. Some do, some don't. But what I'm saying is the data's there. Look at the data. Why does X not own this fund? And these sort of things that are natural, shall we say, that, that should be natural is why do Bruin Dolphin not own this? Why do they own that? Or, you know, these sort of questions are what you should be asking. Okay. So that's three really powerful things to think about the manager and their cult, their approach to marketing and the structure, making sure you're optimized. Anything else that you would sort of add to that list of things to really be focused on as an investment trust? No, I think those are the key things. Obviously, gearing, you've got to decide be it gearing and by managing the structures, gearing as well. But whether you buy back these sort of things, so, yeah. Look, it's a great vehicle. I mean, they they are the best vehicles to manage money to invest it as well. So, and and directors can make a difference if they ask the the questions. And w- one of my rules about going on boards is: can I make a difference? Yeah, it's interesting. One of the it comes up actually. We we run these mastermind groups for board members, and one of the things that comes up with those that we do for investment trust board members is sometimes they feel quite powerless to make changes because they don't feel like they've got that classic CEO board relationship, uh, and it sometimes feels to me like they they don't realize how much they could change. When you get people from other organisations who are sit on boards, they're asked, you know, their challenge often to them is, well, why? What's actually stopping you? And often there's a sort of moment of insight where they think, well, actually, yeah, what is Well, I think, I think the way to look at it is the manager is the CEO. Yeah. And your job is to hire, and, you know, as chairman, your job is to, is to be the non-exec with the, the, the CEO. So to ask the questions and decide whether it's the right CEO or not, which, which you have to, are they performing well? Are they, uh, have they got a good process? All of these sort of things. Those are, those are what they should be spending that time. Martin, I love that. That's going to be so valuable for those sitting on investment trusts listening. Time has flown by, which means it's time to go to our lightning round, where I'm going to say a quick question and ask you for a quick response if you're ready. All right. So first up is the boardroom behavior that irritates you the most. Oh, none. Nothing irritates me. <laughs> You've never been annoyed in a boardroom? Never. Wow. <laughs> never fight with a non-executive director. Never fight with a pig because you get dirty and the pig enjoys it. Exactly. The best book every board member should read and why? Oh, I like the Gladwell micro, what, microeconomic books. I just love them because it's all practical. I don't like macro. I like microeconomics. Your favorite quote and why? It's better to try and fail than never to have tried at all. Your- Too many 
or don't try. The worst professional yeah. advice you have ever received? To not take my friend to the Treasury Select Committee with me. And they wanted him, not me. But when I appeared without him, they killed me instead. Yeah. They, called me a, they called me a sophisticated snake oil salesman. There you go. <laughs> and last but not least, three things that our listeners should take away from this if they take nothing else. Be supportive in tough times, questioning in, questioning in good times, and don't cut at the point of maximum pain. Wow, Martin, that's been such a privilege. I love hearing from founders who've built successful businesses and then also had um, amazing experience as board members. So thank you so much for taking the time to share no, no. them an experience. That's been amazing. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Oliver. Take care. And thanks to all of you listening. We've been blown away by the incredible feedback about how this podcast has been helping you get board roles and become better board members. This podcast is for you, so if you'd like to suggest guests, topics, difficult challenges, or you'd like to share stories about how the podcast has impacted you, or have suggestions on how we can improve, please email podcast at neural.com. That's podcast at neural.com. And let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, thanks again for listening and look forward to having you back here for the next discussion.